Turn off that TV, Brainyard. We can tell you what they're reporting on today and what they're reporting on tomorrow. Actually, you probably already know. The media is reporting this affair as if it's the worst pandemic when in fact it's not. Yeah, that's right. There have been plenty of pandemics worse than the coronavirus, which is, believe it or not, good news. So stop trying to learn the renegade and equip yourself with knowledge of the history of diseases instead. It'll make you far more interesting over your next FaceTime party. But before we get into it, let's start out with the basics. So what is a pandemic? To understand this, we need to break down a bunch of terminology that gets clumped up into one another, especially in this time of information overload. An epidemic is a disease that affects a large number of people within a community, population, or region. The difference between an epidemic and a pandemic is that a pandemic holds a passport. When the World Health Organization recently announced that the coronavirus is a pandemic, that meant that it had spread over multiple countries and continents. All pandemics begin as an endemic, which is an infectious disease that belongs to a particular people or country. An example of this is malaria, which is an endemic in large parts of Africa and some parts of South America. If an endemic increases numbers in a short period of time, then experts would consider it an outbreak. If the situation is not properly controlled, then it becomes an epidemic. So here we are, discussing all the intricate differences between the emic words. They're subtle and yet very important distinctions, just just so we can all understand how serious the situation is. But you knew that you were currently in a pandemic. But did you know it wasn't the first time in history we've encountered a wanderlust travel-loving virus? As it stands, there are about 2.3 million cases worldwide. The World Health Organization estimates that about 7% of the total cases have been fatal. But so far, it's nothing compared to some of history's worst outbreaks. Take the 20th century Spanish flu, which is considered the deadliest pandemic in history. In 1918, a strain of influenza infected an estimated 500 million people worldwide. That's about one-third of the planet's population. It was first observed in Europe, the United States, and parts of Asia before swiftly spreading across the world. At the time, there were no effective drugs or vaccines to this killer flu. People around the world were ordered to wear masks, close schools, theaters, and businesses. Even today, the cause of the Spanish flu is not quite known, which means despite its name, it did not originate from Spain. In fact, historians attribute the association of the Spanish flu to Spain from the fact that the news coverage of the flu derived in that country. During World War I, Spain was a neutral country with a free media that covered the outbreak from the start. Meanwhile, allied countries in the Central Powers had wartime censors who covered up news of the flu to keep morale high. Because Spanish news sources were the only ones reporting on the flu, many believed it originated from there. Which means that another characteristic of outbreaks is apparently misinformation. But moving on. And then there's the fact that the flu hit Spain particularly hard. Even the Spanish king, Alfonso XIII, reportedly contracted the flu. One unusual aspect of the 1918 flu was that it struck down many previously young and healthy people. Of course, as the strain of the flu was spreading, the world was largely at war, which meant that soldiers all over the world were not only fighting for their lives on the battlefield, but were also trying to protect themselves from an invisible enemy. Many historians attribute the high spreadability of the flu to the fact that it coincided with war times. Since soldiers were closely quartered in large numbers, it's very possible that only a few people had the Spanish flu in the beginning, but unknowingly spread it. And the soldiers came home from overseas, and, well, the rest is pandemic history. It's estimated that the flu took about 3% of the world's population, but exact numbers are impossible to confirm due to the lack of medical record keeping in many places. Up next on the pandemic hot list, is smallpox. Smallpox is believed to have first infected humans about 12,000 years ago. In fact, many historians speculate that smallpox likewise brought about the devastating plague of Athens and the Athenine Plague. You may have heard about this early disease in your history classes and the fact that many European explorers unknowingly carried smallpox over to the New World, but the story of the smallpox infected blankets is for another time. When it reached Europe in the 6th century, a bishop in France described its symptoms to include a violent fever, followed by, yeah, you guessed it, small red pox all over the body. When experts at the time figured out that no one can contract smallpox twice, survivors of the disease were often called upon to try to nurse victims back to life. In fact, some doctors tried to purposefully expose young
young and healthy individuals with a mild strain of smallpox so they could contract the disease and go on to help others. And if those aren't wacky enough stories of early medicine, then there's the fact that some doctors thought exposure to red objects would serve as a remedy for smallpox. And then there's the fact that many historical leaders were reported to have contracted the infectious disease. We're talking the monarchs of England, Russia, Ethiopia, China, and Japan. Queen Elizabeth I of England and the U.S. President Abraham Lincoln also apparently contracted smallpox during their time in office, though they lived to tell the tale. After centuries of havoc, smallpox was officially declared eradicated by the World Health Organization on May 8, 1980, 14 centuries later from its first major wave in Europe. A Brit named Edward Jenner, an 18th century doctor, is credited with discovering a vaccine for smallpox. Without going into too much detail, the discovery involved milkmaids and a milder virus called cowpox. We told you early medicine was wacky. Which brings us to the disease so famous it has its own book, The Black Death. Archaeologist Hugh Wilmot at the University of Sheffield says that amongst experts, hundreds of millions of people fell victim to the bubonic plague. In fact, it wiped out half of England's very own population. The name Black Death is suggested to be a mistranslation by some fancy Latin experts. If you were interested in a true translation, it's more or less the terrible death due to its plentiful symptoms, including gangrene, which refers to when extremities go black. It all started in the Middle East and Europe in the 14th century, but the period you're probably most familiar with is actually considered the Second Plague, which affected mostly Europe. It's believed to have been the result of an infectious fever likely transmitted from rodents to humans by the bite of infected fleas. Let's just say the history of the Black Plague gets a little dark. Get it? Because of the color black? Never mind. In the early 1500s, England imposed a law to separate and isolate the sick. Homes with sick people were marked by bales of hay strung to a pole outside of the doors. And if you had an infected family member, you had to carry a white pole with you when you went in public. We don't even want to talk about what they did to domestic cats, dogs, and animals alike. But let's just say that you should hug your dog, Rufus, a bit tighter tonight, Brainyard. Doctors and medical professionals even geared up in famous beak or bird-like masks to protect themselves from infection up until the last major plague outbreak of 1720. But some good did come out of all of this. Some historians argue that public health had improved to such an extent that it developed systematic and effective use of sanitary legislation. In other words, cleaner sewers, anti-littering policies, and weekly regulated garbage pickups. And then there's also the fact that the end of the plague marked the end of cheap labor, which encouraged technological innovation throughout the world. So it's clear that this isn't the world's first pandemic, which, as we said earlier, is actually good news. Governments, healthcare workers, and policymakers currently have lots of historical examples of how best to fight the current situation. They they aren't looking as far as smallpox and the Black Plague, but the 1918 influenza situation definitely has a valuable lesson or two. Although every epidemic is different, there was a strong relationship between early and strict intervention in containing the virus. On the non-pharmaceutical side, canceling public gatherings, closing schools and businesses, and self-isolation are all steps previously taken during other outbreaks. Social distancing is also an important step to containing a disease. And a 2007 academic study of the 1918 influenza, cities in the United States that intervened early and intensively slowed transmission through the practice of social distancing. Take St. Louis in Missouri, which showed smaller peaks at the time of the influenza compared to cities that took longer to act, such as Philadelphia. There's even recent evidence when a report compared Chinese cities, Wuhan and Guangzhou from January to February 2020. Guangzhou implemented strict social distancing within a week, which resulted in lower epidemic sizes and peaks, whereas Wuhan Wuhan did so six weeks later, and well, we all know how that turned out. To this day, there's no treatment or vaccine available for the 1918 influenza, but it was considered eradicated in the summer of 1919 due to the world's immunity levels. As for vaccines for diseases, our history shows that we've made great progress in similar times. Take the 2009 H1N1 flu. When vaccine research started in April 2009, a vaccine became tried, tested, and available in December later that year. Then the pandemic was considered eradicated in August 2010. This goes to show that we 
are now more than ever equipped to research and discover vaccines thanks to contemporary medicine. It took H1N1 to find a vaccine in eight months, which is far more advanced than the decades it took the milkmaid doctor to find a vaccine for smallpox. So what does this all mean? What can we learn from it? That the human race is pretty resilient. Although no two outbreaks are the same, there are valuable lessons that we can take away from each scenario. The policies implemented by local governments are totally up to code and normal considering the circumstances. In fact, you should actually feel a bit relieved, Brainerd, because of the technology we have in place. Could you imagine people socially distancing before the invention of YouTube? Yeah, we can't. The bottom line is that our current situation isn't the first threatening disease that's surged around the world, nor will it be the last. But things could be worse. It could start turning black. Until next time, keep your head up, Brainerd. See you later.